Shall we turn now in our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 27 as we continue our study through the Bible. The one thing about the Bible is its plain honesty. It talks about men as they really are. It doesn't try to create idols of men. You know, the whole thing of Hollywood is creating images so that you think a person is something other than they really are. One of the most difficult and disappointing things is meeting some of these Hollywood actors and actresses. Because they have built up this image, you know, of this is what they are, and then you meet them, and they're just plain dull. Some of them, some of them are sparkly in their personality, no doubt, but some of those that I met are just really duds. But they have this image built up around them, you know, and, and it's amazing how they are able to emote once the, the cameras go on. You know, you can be talking to them and they're just sort of a dull dud, and then when the camera goes on, it's just, you know, I mean, they're just a whole different person and a personality. I mean, it's just, it's just entirely different, but this whole image has been built up. And so we are prone to think of them other than they really are. Not the Bible. It doesn't give you any false illusions about anybody. Even those men in the Bible who through the centuries have been the heroes. And who has been a greater hero than David? It, of course, maybe not with you, but with me, I've always admired this guy for his daring. I love it when Saul's pursuing him that he's daring enough to slip down into the camp of Saul with Abishai. I mean, go right into the camp, you know. And uh, I love this guy for his bravery and for his daring. And yet the Bible is so blunt and so honest with his mistakes. It leaves us no illusions. He's a man. Subject like we are to discouragement, to fear, and to mistakes. And as we get into the 27th chapter of 1 Samuel, we see David in one of the low points of his life. He had been under pressure for some time now because Saul had been pursuing him and Saul was bent on killing him. Wherever David would seek to hide from Saul, there were always those people around who, willing to gain some kind of a favor from Saul, told Saul where David was attempting to hide. And again, as David is in the wilderness of Ziph, the people go and they tell Saul, is not David hiding again among us in the hill of Jezimon and so forth? And so Saul came down and David had another narrow escape from Saul. Too many times, too much pressure, and David begins to snap. He is discouraged. Fear has gripped his heart. He is despairing. And these are the words of despair with which we open chapter 27. And David said in his heart, or said to his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. Guy's going to get me. One day he's going to run me through with that javelin. I shall perish one day. Talk about negative confessions. That is one. However, contrary to the teaching of positive and negative confessions, though that was a negative confession, you don't get what you say because Saul didn't do David in. Some people are fearful of making a negative confession 
confessions. Oh, oh, you should have said, oh, it's going to happen to you now, you know. Negative confessions, and, you know, you create your own reality by what you say and all. And, and that's a lot of... <laughs> baloney. <laughs> now, David's declaration of despair showed that he had lost faith in the promise of God. God had promised that David would sit upon the throne. God had declared that he had rejected Saul from being king and David was going to rule in his stead. For David in his heart to say, I know that one day Saul is going to kill me, is a lack of faith in what God has promised. How opposite from Abraham, who could not see the way out, but because he had God's word, knew that God was going to do it. I don't know how God can do it. But I know he will because he gave his word. David had the word of God just as Abraham, but David failed miserably in this test of faith. For he said, I know one day Saul's going to kill me. No, David, that can't be. If you are going to sit on the throne, and if God has promised that you're going to sit upon the throne, there's no way that Saul can kill you. But Saul has been pursuing, and David is tired of running. And his faith definitely is lapsing at this point. And as so many people, when his faith in the promises of God began to lapse, he began then to devise himself a means of escape. Take things into my own hands. I don't believe that God is able to take care of me any longer. I don't believe that God will continue to deliver me from the hand of Saul. I don't think that God is sufficient to take care of my need, and therefore I better take care of myself. Oh man, do we get into trouble with that kind of thinking. Whenever I think that I better do something for myself because obviously God isn't going to work, God isn't going to keep His word, God is going to fail, so I better take over now, and I better plan my way out of this. That is just an open invitation for disaster. The minute I think that I can take better care of my life than God, the minute I think that I can improve upon God's plan for me, and that I've got to take it over now and do it myself, or... When I think I've got to help God out, well, I know God wants to, but, you know, how can he do it without my help? And I get in and I say, oh, God, let me help you now. You know, I realize you need a little help here. And, and so uh, let me do my part, you know. It's like when my grandkids come and say, oh, Grandpa, I want to help you. I shudder. <laughs> I love it. But I know the job is going to take me about five times as long with their help. You know, I can mow the lawn in two minutes flat. But when my little grandson is helping me, oh man, it takes a long time to mow that lawn. And so when we, I wonder what God does when we say, okay, God, I want to help you, you know, oh, come on. And we think we've got to help God fulfill his plans. And so David began to devise his own means of escape from Saul. His own means of preservation. I don't believe God can preserve me. So here's what I'm going to do. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. Oh, what a 
false conclusion. Nothing better for me. Really, there is nothing better for you than you just submit yourself totally to the will of God. Nothing better that you just commit yourself completely into his care, David. That's the best thing for you. But David is now filled with fear. Fear has fought off the faith. He is despairing. I know he's going to kill me. There's nothing better for me than to escape speedily to the Philistines. And this word speedily really gives you the clue and the key to the whole thing. Because whenever Satan is beginning to pressure you into action, it's always quick. Hurry. Don't think about it. As in high tops, don't think about the consequences. Don't think about the old routine. Don't think about the consequences. You'll come out clean, you know. And don't move, move, quick, quick, hurry. How many times have we gotten into trouble with this quick, speedily, hurry up and do it now? And we act before we have an opportunity to pray. Before we have an opportunity to even think it through. We move out on our own without seeking the counsel of God. And this was David's problem. You see, he had the priest with him. The priest had brought the ephod. David had been consulting God. God warned David that Saul was indeed coming. And God showed him and, and delivered him as he sought God through the priest. But in this case, there's nothing about David seeking the Lord. Seeking the will of God. He is acting now just out of his own analysis of the situation and not seeking the guidance and the counsel of God and moving quickly. Oh, I better speedily get down there. Watch out when Satan begins to push you. You don't have time to pray about this. You better act now. You're going to miss this opportunity. If you don't get it now, man, it's going to be gone forever. Quick, move. And Satan so often pressures us into actions that we spend years regretting because we hurried into a situation without waiting upon God first and getting the mind of God. If God wants it for you, it'll be there tomorrow. You don't have to worry about that. It'll be there next week. You can spend a week in prayer on it. And if God wants you to have it, it'll still be there. I've done this so many times with different things. In fact, I find that if God wants me to have it, I just wait for it. The price usually goes down pretty well, too. <laughs> there, was a, uh, there was a car in Huntington Beach at Williams Oldsmobile, beautiful black Oldsmobile that I wanted. The salesman showed it to me. Uh, it was just out of my price range. It was a used car, but it was still out of my price range. Only had 12,000 miles. It was owned by an oil executive in Huntington Beach in the days when oil executives had money. <laughs> you heard about the two women walking down the street and uh, this little frog came hopping up and it said, would you pick me up, please? And the lady picked up the frog and it says, kiss me, please. And she said, why should I kiss you? And he said, well, I am a Texas oil man and I had a hex put on me and I was turned into a frog. And if you'll kiss me, I can be an oil man again. And the woman stuffed the frog in her purse and her friend said, aren't you going to kiss it? She said, my goodness, no, a talking frog is worth a lot more than a Texas oil man nowadays. <laughs> Anyhow, I wanted this car. <laughs> but the price was just too high. And so the salesman brought it by and showed it to me and all, and I drove it around. Oh, it was just, you know, just a nice car. Uh, and I needed a car, but it was just 
too much. Well, a month later, the salesman called me up and he said, we still have this car down here, Chuck, and you know, sure nice car. And I said, yeah, but I said, it's just, I can't afford it, you know. Uh, it's just out of my range. Two months later, the guy called up and he said, the boss told me to call up and tell you to name your price. He can't get rid of this car. <laughs> and it's, it's such a nice car, he can't understand why it won't sell. So he figures you must be praying. So you name it and <laughs> you tell us what you can pay for it. <laughs> Boy, did I enjoy that car. If God wants you to have it, you're going to get it. You know, you don't have to sign the dotted line right now. It's going to be gone tomorrow. We've got five guys waiting in line to get this, you know. But that speedily, David says, I will speedily go down. And Saul will despair of me to seek me anymore in the coast of Israel. And so I will escape out of his hands. So David's own plan of escape devised his own survival. And David arose and he passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam and the Jezreelitess and Abigail the Carmelitess, who, were, who was at one time Nabal's wife. And it was told Saul that David was fled to Gath and he sought no more again for him. So you say, hey, wait a minute, though, it worked. You know, why fault David? You know, the plan worked. It was a good plan. Saul didn't chase him any further. There is a damnable philosophy that the ends justify the means, but that is not always so. In fact, it is difficult to justify the means by the end results. Here the end results were good, but it doesn't justify what David did, his lapse of faith, his failure to trust in God. Because when you take that turn from God's path, you're on now a path that's going to lead you ever downward into the pit. And David turning aside from God's path has begun now a path that we shall follow as we see our hero going down deeper and deeper into the pit until he gets so low that I cannot believe that this is David, God's man and God's choice. So David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Then Achish gave him Ziglag, Wherefore, Ziglag pertaineth to the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. So he was 16 months there in the land of the Philistines, living in the country town of Ziglag. And David and his men went up and he invaded the Gersherites and the Gezrites and the Amalekites. For those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land as you go toward Shur, even toward the land of Egypt. So he began these incursions against these Bedouin-type people, their villages in the area of the Negev Desert, south from uh, the area of Gath into the um, area towards Egypt. These were really raiding parties. David was ripping off the cattle and the sheep, the donkeys, and stealing their goods. And David 
would smite the land and he would not leave man or woman alive. But he took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels and their clothes and he returned and he would come to Achish and give Achish a portion of the spoil. You cannot justify what David is doing. It is wrong to destroy people and to rob them of their goods. But this is the path of a man who is headed down. He's turned aside now from God's path. And he's begun a downward trend. And so Achish said, Oh, where have you made your invasions or your inroads today? And David said, oh, I went against the south of Judah and against the south of the Jeromelites and against the south of the Kenites. In other words, uh, the Jeromelites were actually one of the families, the major families of the tribe of Judah and against the southern part of Judah and the Kenites were uh, a protectorate tribe of Israel. So that David lied outright lied to Achish about where he was gaining these spoils. He was actually taking the spoils from the people that were friends to the Philistines, but wiping them out completely so there'd be no witnesses. And then as Achish would say, oh, you know, where did you grab, where did you rip these off? You know, and they say, oh, I went over to southern Judah and you know, wiped out a couple of their towns and took these. And, and he was outright lying unto Achish. And David did not save either a man or a woman alive to bring tidings to Gath, saying, lest they should tell on us, saying, so did David, and so will be his manner all the while he dwells in the country of the Philistines. He didn't leave any witnesses. No one was there to report on what David was doing. Horribly wrong committing these horrible crimes and then killing all the witnesses. And there is no excuse and no justification for David's actions. He was horribly wrong. And he deceived Achish so that Achish believed David. And it's too bad this king trusted David, believed David, and David was just a liar. And he said to himself, He has made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. It sort of pleased Achish because he figured that David, you know, going against Judah, they're all angry with him now. They all hate him. And so, you know, he'll never be able to go back. He'll be my servant forever. So it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, Know thou assuredly that you shall go out with me to battle, you with your men. And David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. And so Achish said to David, I will make you the keeper of my own head forever. You'll be my personal bodyguard. Yeah, I know how valiant and tough and strong you are in battle. You'll be my personal bodyguard. Now Samuel the prophet was dead, and all of Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away all of those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Uh, that is, people who were dabbling in spiritism, the mediums or the witches who would contact the dead and be channelers in the common parlance today. Uh, the New Age parlance is channelers. And, and they had gotten rid of all of these channelers, people whose bodies became possessed by the demons who, who spoke, uh, you know, uh, declaring to be Ramtha or some other spirit. The Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem, and Saul gathered all of Israel together and they pitched in Gelboa. So they're getting ready to face off in this gigantic battle. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid. And his heart greatly trembled. 
And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by the Urim, nor by the prophets. So Saul was seeking guidance from the Lord, but God was no longer speaking to Saul. Saul had rebelled against God. Saul refused to obey the command of God. He had been rejected by God because he had rejected God. And so here he is seeking, and it is interesting, these are the three of the ways by which they sought guidance from God through dreams. For God would speak often to them through dreams. Or through the Urim, which was uh, the going to the priest and him having this little uh, Urim that he wore. Uh, on the ephod, on his uh, chest, and they believed that it was probably two stones, a white stone, a black stone. You ask a question and pull out a stone. If it's the white stone, the answer is yes. If it's the black stone, the answer is no. Uh, from this later came the idea of being blackballed, uh, which was a, a, a continuation, dropping a ball in, and when you vote for a man to come in the club or not, you each have, you know, your... Uh, white and black ball or white and black marble and you drop in and there's a black marble in there then you've been blackballed but uh, the idea is is to be uh, is the answer no uh, or yes and thus they inquired of the Lord or oftentimes God would speak to them through prophets and throughout the Old Testament so many times we find the prophet of the Lord coming to a king and speaking to him the word of the Lord now with Saul God wasn't speaking no prophets. He wouldn't respond through the Urim. Nor was there any uh, dreams. And thus, Saul said to his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, or a demon spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that has a demon spirit or familiar spirit at Endor, which was not that far from Gilboa where Saul was camped with his men. And so Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by your familiar spirit, and bring me up the one that I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off all of those that have the familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then are you trying to trap me for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to you for this thing. Then the woman said unto him, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring up Samuel. Now, there are those today who purportedly contact the spirits of the dead. And there are people who go to them in order to contact some dead relative. And these people gain credence by oftentimes when in this trance and supposedly the voice of your dead relative begins to speak to you, they will talk to you about incidences of the past of which only you and this person were familiar with. And thus, as soon as they began to say, remember that glorious weekend we had at Carmel and how when we were sitting out there on the balcony, you know, we saw that a well uh, that surfaced out there in the bay. Remember, and you think, ooh, you know, this has got to be it because no one, we, you know, that was a glorious weekend. No one knew that. Oh, and, and you're, you're sucked in. This is done quite often by demonic spirits. 
these demons are around. They know what's going on. And oftentimes these people who are the mediums, or as the newest word, channelers, are really demon-possessed. They are able to reveal startling and interesting facts of the past. And because of this, people are deceived into believing that they are actually contacting the spirits of their dead relatives. There's nothing new about this. It's been around since the beginning almost. There are laws against this in the book of Deuteronomy. And so it's existed from way back when. Even before the law was written, these kind of people uh, had learned how to contact and how to uh, be possessed by demon spirits and how to be the channelers for these demon spirits. This witch of Endor was such a medium. She was possessed by a demon spirit and did have powers, demonic powers. Now, when... Saul came to her. He requested that she bring back the spirit of the man that he would name. And she said, well, you know that King Saul has ordered all of the witches put to death. And he swore unto her, and interesting, in this interesting, he swore unto her by the Lord that she wouldn't be put to death. Now, an interesting thing also. You remember when Saul came back from the destruction of the Amalekites where God said, utterly destroy them, don't leave anyone alive. The Amalekites were still alive. David was making raids against the Amalekites. And we're going to find where the Malachites made a raid against David. They were left alive. Saul did not obey the voice of God. In fact, interestingly enough, oh, we'll get to that next week. Uh, don't want to tell you everything I want to know in one night. Oh, I'll tell you. <laughs> Saul was killed by an Amalekite. Now, Amalek was a type of the flesh. He was told to utterly destroy them, utterly destroy the flesh. In failing to do so, he was destroyed by an, an Amalekite. Interesting. If you don't bring the flesh to the cross, the flesh can destroy you. The flesh life can destroy your spiritual walk. So how important. Now, remember though, when he disobeyed, he didn't obey the command of God, and Samuel came out to meet him, and he said, as the Lord liveth, I've done everything, you know, the Lord commanded me. And he said, if you've done everything the Lord commanded, then how come I hear the sheep and the cattle? And he said, oh, I brought these back to sacrifice them to God. And he said, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to hearken is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Already he had been guilty of, of, the, uh, of a similar type of sin. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And here he is now consulting the witch. Entering into witchcraft. So she said, who do you want me to you know, bring up for you? And he said, Samuel. So she went into her trance. And as she did, she saw Samuel. And when she saw Samuel, she screamed with a loud voice. She was probably shocked herself that it worked. I mean, here she she saw this spirit ascending and, and, it, and it frightened her. She screamed. And the woman spoke to Saul and she said, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul. 
And the king said unto her, Cool it, lady. What did you see? Don't be afraid. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. He said unto her, What form was he? And she said, He was an old man who was coming up. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Now, it doesn't say that Saul saw him. Her description, he perceived that it was Samuel. I find something interesting here, and I don't, well, I just throw it out, and you can do with it, you can throw it out too, but uh, just something interesting. I question that he would still look like an old man in the spirit state. I don't think that you're going to ever be in eternity in the state in which you die. Otherwise, it would be better for all of us to kick off at about 25 or so, you know. <laughs> and the fact that there was the appearance of an old man, you see, well, his body was in the grave. It, it was, you know, it, it couldn't have been his body. That was already decayed in some sarcophagus someplace. And so she, she sees this old man with a mantle. Interesting. And you can do with it whatever you want. But he began to speak to Saul. And Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me to bring me up? Now, prior, of course, to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, everyone who died went into Sheol, into Hades. And as... You that were here a few Thursday nights ago, we discovered that Hades is in the center of the earth, so bringing me up. Why have you disquieted me or disturbed me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me. Oh, what a tragedy. What a confession. God is departed from me. How sad and tragic the life when God has departed from a person. He doesn't answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. You know, he had killed 85 of the priests of God. He had wiped out these men of God. So there's really no men of God uh, around to, to speak to him. And he has not spoken to me by dreams or by prophets. Therefore, I've called thee that you might make known to me what I shall do. And then Samuel said, Why do you ask this of me, seeing that the Lord is departed from you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done unto you even as he spoke to you by me, for the Lord has rent the kingdom or torn the kingdom out of your hand and has given it unto your neighbor, even unto David. Because, and this is the reason why God took the kingdom of him, from him, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor did you execute his fierce judgment or wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Saul, you've had it, man. And the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And so, what news could be worse? It was so, so awesome that Saul just fainted. He just fell on the ground, the full length of his body along the earth. And he was 
sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. There was no strength in him, for he had not eaten any bread all that day or all that night. And the woman came unto Saul, and she saw that he was sore troubled, and she said unto him, Behold, your handmaid has obeyed your voice, and I've put my life in my hand, and I have hearkened unto your words which you spoke to me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou to the voice of your handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before you, and eat that you may have strength, that you might go on your way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants together with a woman compelled him. So he arose from the earth, and he sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house, and she hurried and killed it and took the flour and kneaded it and baked some unleavened bread. Didn't have time for the bread to rise. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants and they did eat. And he rose up and went away that night. And so things are closing in on Saul. But meantime, we go back to David. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek. And the Israelites pitched by the fountain which is in Jezreel. They're up in the middle part of the kingdom in the valley of Armageddon, Ezralon, Jezreel, in the area of Mount Gilboa. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by the hundreds and by the thousands, but David and his men passed in the rearward with Achish. So David was bringing up the rear with Achish. And the princes of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews here? And Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me for these years? And I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me unto this day. Uh, of course, he had been deceived by David, but uh, he said, Hey, this is David who came to live with me, you know, and he's a good man. The princes of the Philistines were angry with Achish, and the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Get rid of this guy, that, we may, that he may go again to the place which you have appointed him, and let him not go with us into battle, lest in the battle he turn against us and be our adversary. For why sh should he not reconcile unto his master? Uh, should it not be with the heads of these men? In other words, what better way could he make up with Saul than in the midst of battle turn and cut our heads off? You know, and so... Uh, no way will we allow him to go into battle with us. Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in their dances, saying, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord liveth, you have been upright. You're going out and you're coming in with me, and the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Wherefore now return and go in peace, that you not displease the Lord of the Philistines. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what have you found in your servants so long as I have been with you unto this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And here we find David at the lowest. You see, ultimately, he went to fight against God with the enemies of God. He had sunk so low, and we watched his progress downward, that now he calls God's people his enemies, or the enemies of my king, and I'm ready to go and fight against the enemies of of my Lord the King and announces that Achish is his Lord, his King and he's ready to fight against the enemies of Achish. The sad, tragic thing is that many times when a person turns away from the path of God he never intended to go as far as he does. He didn't intend that it get him this involved. He didn't intend to get so far enmeshed in, in that sin that one day he would turn his back upon God and become an enemy to God or to the people of God. Finding himself now in that position of fighting against the people of God 
He has come to rock bottom. This is as low as David could sink. It's a shame we can't go into the next chapter. We have to leave David in the pit. <laughs> but next week we'll see the grace of God as God brings him out. Uh, but with some heavy, heavy dealings. But here's David. He's sort of feigning, you know. Hey, you know, what have I done, man? You know, I want to b fight with you, you know. And, and he's, I think it's sort of a put on with David. I think he's taking advantage of a situation and, and playing his cards to the... You know, playing them all the way out and just, uh, you know, uh, putting on this thing. Hey, man, I'm ready to fight with you. You know, what have I done? And, you know, I'm ready to go into battle. But Achish answered and said to David, I know that you are good in my sight as an angel of God. Oh, man, how David had him fool. I mean, uh, you know, people like to put on this kind of a, holy aura though you know I'm like an angel of God I'm so holy and so good and here he's lying through his teeth to the guy and and deceiving him and and doing all these dastardly things and and yet you know his appearance uh, before uh, Achish is is just you know like this noble man who's out uh, ripping off all the Israelites and bringing me the loot you know Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said he will not go with us into battle. Therefore, rise up early in the morning with your servants that have come with you, and as soon as it is light, depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So David parted from their company, went on back, and... Um, we see him at the bottom, at the bottom of his career. Uh, and next week we see where God uh, restores David. Uh, and, and this is the beautiful thing. You see, if, if the Bible didn't give us this insight of David, it, if the Bible only gave us the, the high points of David's life, only gave us the victories, only gave us his strong faith in God and trust in God, if we only had the Psalms, you know, and, and didn't know all of these other things about David's life, we think, wow, wouldn't it be great to be like David so God could use me? But I know God can't use me because, man, you know, I've told lies. And I've failed. Man, there have been times when I've been afraid. And, uh, you know, my faith was weak. And God can't use me. Oh, if my faith were only strong like David's, always strong, then God could use me. But you see, God points out that David had his flaws. In fact, some of them much worse than yours. And yet God used David. Being weak, failing, does not disqualify me. If I will yield my life to God, if I will just repent of my sin and ask God's forgiveness, God will use me as his instrument to do his work. And God can still use you. You may have sunk pretty deep in the pit. I don't know that you have sunk as low as David. But God is forgiving. And God is merciful. And if you'll just seek God, He will restore you and God will use you to do His work. That's to me the beauty of the whole story. God lets us know that the men he uses are not perfect men. They are people just like us, filled with flaws, fraught with failures. And yet, God in his grace uses them to do his work. And so may God make each of us his instruments as we yield ourselves unto God. And may God help us to guard against despair, discouragement, fear. 
that lack of faith and trust in the promises of God that would drive me to try to do things on my own because that is the beginning of the path that if I follow it will lead me to the bottom. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity tonight of again looking at your word. And thank you again, Father, for speaking to our hearts through your word. And now, Father, we come before you confessing our own failures, our own weaknesses, and presenting our bodies to you as living sacrifices that you, Lord, might use us in whatever manner you desire to accomplish your will and your plan on this earth. Lord, we realize that we are living in perilous times. We see the enemies of God as they are gathering together their forces seeking to destroy the people of God and according to their own confession seeking to destroy God and the thought of God out of the minds and hearts of people. Lord, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. May we stand up in faith, Lord, knowing that as the church of Jesus Christ, we have the word of Jesus that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. And so, Lord, we stand in your name to do as you see fit, your instruments to do your will for your glory. Amen. It's going to be a busy week filled with a lot of activities as we prepare for the glorious celebration next Sunday. Jesus is risen and our hope for eternal life is affirmed. May God be with you this week. Watch over and keep you. May his hand be upon your life to guide. And may you walk in the will of the Lord for his glory. In Jesus' name.